Hello, and thank you for joining us on uh, another one of our dolphin discussions. Uh, my name is James Gutman, and today we are going to be talking about the road ahead for electric vehicles. I am especially excited today to have a, a, a very dear old friend and colleague from back when uh, I used to work at Ford Motor Company in the, in the economics group, uh, Ellen Hughes, Hughes Cromwick. Um, so Ellen has a, a, a really impressive career that, that spans uh, academia, government, finance, and industry. She's, she's really had a chance to look at the world from all the, all the different angles. And that includes, and it's not limited to, but it includes uh, her recent stint as uh, chief economist at the Department of Commerce under the Obama administration, and prior to that, uh, uh, her period as the, the chief economist at Ford Motor Company, where I knew her. And most recently, currently, she's been working as a senior fellow uh, at Third Way, which is a, a, a really highly regarded think tank, um, very cutting edge on a lot of issues um, that are of, of, of relevance today. And in particular, she's focused on climate policy, climate and energy policy. So we thought it would be a great opportunity to have Ellen come by and have a chat with us about um, sort of the intersection of, of those two issues, electric vehicles or uh, electrification of personal mobility and, um, and the, the auto space and how this might be, um, might be of interest or relevance to, to some, of, some of the investment ideas that we look at. So I've also asked my colleague, Annie Giavelli to join, uh, who focuses on uh, the ESG thematic overlay that we that we use here at Dolphin uh, because these because of the overlap between these two um, these two areas. So so Ellen, again, thank you very much uh, for joining us. I'm really excited to uh, to have you here. It's very good to see you again. Thank you. Great to be here. I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kick this off, and I'll let you drive, um, so to speak. So um, as I said, we're, we're talking today about uh, electrification and personal mobility of, of electric vehicles in the auto space. And um, maybe we could start by getting just a, a high level overview as to how you see this process for the transition to, uh, to, electri to electrification uh, going and, and what you see as some of the, the, the obstacles, roadblocks that, that we need to think about. Great, thanks a lot for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. You know, uh, it was only 24 months ago when I thought based on a lot of work that I'd done around battery economics, that the transition to electrified transportation was really a super long-term prospect. But very recently, we have seen substantial breakthroughs in battery technology that are making electrified transportation closer in terms of the time dimension and also much more cost effective. I want to start just by saying a couple of things, one of which is most of you probably know that tr the transportation sector is the largest contributor to CO2 emissions globally. Here in the US, it's about 28% and it outshines, unfortunately, in terms of its contribution, the power sector, which is pretty amazing to think about. The transition to renewables and away from coal in the power sector has meant that it has reduced its contribution to CO2 emissions. And at the same time, transportation has lagged and now is the largest contributor. James, the first thing I wanna say then in this context is the technology advances are generating now an incredible opportunity to reduce CO2 emissions in the transport sector and it largely ties to these developments around batteries and battery technology. I was super fortunate to be at the University of Michigan Energy Institute for a couple of years where they have two battery labs and uh, just incredible fun to see different customers coming in and testing different technologies, different chemistries. 
And it really gave me a bird's eye view around what the art of the possible was in terms of abundant material use for batteries and what companies are doing themselves to push the envelope. So I'll stop here and we can, you know, maybe kind of delve nope. into different aspects of this. Lots of, lots of, I'm sorry, um, lot, lots of different uh, um, sort of uh, threads that we need to, that we need to start pulling on. So, so let me just ask straight off the bat. Um, totally understand what you're saying about CO2 emissions and how, um, and how the transportation space has really, has really become the, the lion's share of that contribution uh, as we phase out dirty coal or, or coal started to phase out coal. Um, but to what extent does electrification just mean that we're pushing that pollution upstream? I mean, if, if the power to run the vehicle now has to be uh, pulled in and stored in a battery, I'm still generating the power um, at a nuclear plant, uh, hopefully a hydro plant or something that's clean and renewable, but maybe not. Maybe it's gonna be something that's not so clean or renewable. Has there been any, any, any sort of analysis that's been done to kind of look not just at the CO2 um, uh, price tag, so to speak, across the entire chain, but also how we're getting into potentially other sources of pollution. So for example, if I'm, um, you know, nuclear waste is not, it's not CO2 waste, but it's still waste. Um, has there been any sort of any sort of work done that would help me kind of wrap my head around that? Yeah, that's a great question. We have in the U.S. a very large system of energy research laboratories, and one in particular, which is just south of Chicago, Illinois, called Argonne National Lab. Mm -hmm. has developed what is called the GREET model, and it is available to anyone. It's out in the public domain for free. And that model allows researchers to develop life cycle emissions calculations from a whole mm -hmm. host of different power and other activities in the economy. Recently, a graduate student at the University of Michigan and I did uh, some work to establish what the life cycle emissions would be if the US transitioned to 100% electric vehicle sales by 2035. And the short answer is, yes, there are significant improvements in terms of bringing CO2 emissions down from a life cycle standpoint. At the same time, the true benefit won't happen until we get all of the internal combustion engine vehicles off the road. And that really is a longer term prospect, hopefully by 2050. That really is the target to be net zero by 2050. And that means all vehicles on the road, transport will have to be electric at that point. Okay, so, so, so you're looking at uh, 2035 as 100% um, of sales are BEV or battery electric vehicles, and the rest of the internal com combustion engines engines are off the road. The park is purely electric by 2050. Is that an ambitious forecast, or is this, um, or is this? <laughs> It's very, it's very ambitious. Thank you. And I'll just give you, a, I'll give you a couple of uh, markers here. The International Energy Agency every year produces a global electric vehicle outlook report. The latest one was just released. It's uh, almost 300 pages. And their forecast right now under what they call the sustainable development scenario is that globally we'll have 245 million electric vehicles on the roads globally by 2030. Well, 245 million out of a total number of vehicles in operation uh, over a billion, I think probably by that point, 1.4 billion. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, 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 total sounds, that total sounds broadly like what the US park is. I'm just guessing because it's been a while. Yes, yeah. that's right. Okay, so that's, that suggests that you're at the very optimistic side of the spectrum. 
Yes, we we are. Uh, I I am. I'll say that's my my forecast. Uh, in partly because I do think that the risks of climate change will become much more transparent as we get into this decade. And as we begin to measure what those climate risks are, for example, the metrics and guideposts that are included in the task force for climate related financial disclosures. You know, investors will begin to get much better information and measurement of climate risks on co company balance sheets. As they see that, they'll look at the prospect of investing in decarbonization activities. And I do think that that will foster even greater innovation and cost down measures, especially on the battery. For example, we're seeing that right now. And that's why Bloomberg New Energy Finance just updated their forecast to show that we'll get to electric vehicle price parity with the internal combustion engine vehicle for large cars in Europe by 2024. Think about that. If you're in <laughs> parity by 2024, why would you purchase a gasoline or diesel powered vehicle? And from a, an automaker standpoint, why would I want to produce that? Because a, an electric vehicle has 10, 20% of the components of a, a ga gasoline or diesel powered. Fewer components things that break. Yes, exactly. And you might have read too that. Uh, CATL, which is one of the largest battery makers globally, has now really developed a million mile battery. And that means that the wear and tear and operation cost of an electric vehicle is yet again going to fall. All of these are really favorable developments that work toward my forecast. <laughs> um, all right, all right. Any, can, we, can we just roll back a little bit? Because I wanted, because Ellen was, was talking a little bit about um, sort of the, the, the ways in which we're going to get investors interested in this as an opportunity to deploy capital in an ESG context, but that also can then deliver the, the resources that these guys need in order to generate the sort of um, innovations that we're looking for. So, so how, does, how does that strike you from, from, from the work that you've been doing on the ESG front? I think it, that's the step uh, Ellen has definitely touched on uh, one of the you know hot uh, topics and one of the key points that we discuss about even during uh, our previous webinars on uh, impact investment in ESG. The fact that you know the process uh, needs to be more transparent and people and well, including uh, not just investors but everyone is becoming more aware of certain matters. That are really quite urgent, but now you're seeing the real effect on your daily life. Um, you know, like I, I don't know if you remember last time I did. Uh, maybe um, Alan hasn't watched the webinar yet. Um, I started my impact webinar with you know the a blue sky uh, mm -hmm. by saying you know in India in China you could actually see the blue sky, <laughs> which is a miracle because normally I I spent few years in Beijing. Um, I have to say it's always like a yellowish and gray, especially during the winter. Um, it's really hard to see anything that's blue. So I think people are realizing that climate change is real. Um, <laughs> the climate change is real and it's having a real effect on, on people's life and investors wants to express themselves through the investment um, strategies and the choices of the companies they want to invest into. So the the E factor was already the, maybe the most relevant investment factor among E, F, G. But I think um, after, you know, well, we're still in the middle of, you know, like this crisis, but I think afterwards people will want to look at the combination of ESG factors uh, along the um, value creation chain. So, so yeah, I think there is definitely a shift of consciousness um, and the people and investors are, are, are more aware for sure. Okay, uh, so, so people want to look out their sky and want to be able to, to actually
see the sky. Um, so, and, and as uh, very much to Ellen's point, um, I think it's it's really difficult to to deny because uh, that intentionally uh, climate change. Um, it's extremely difficult, and as, as people are increasingly aware of our role in climate change, they want to then invest uh, accordingly. And as Ellen pointed out, there's um, there's a lot of financial accountability or account financial information that needs to be produced in order for people to deploy that capital. Because you have this combination of desire, I want my money to be doing something that's actually good for uh, the longer term. You have uh, the financial transparency that allows you to know that yes, this company is actually going to produce what I think it's going to produce from an ESG context. Um, and then you've got people like Annie helping to to make sure that that, that capital finds its way. So that then generates the the the, the capital that people need in order to make these innovations. Now, before we go back to uh, what sort of uh, obstacles we face on the ES, on, on the, I'm sorry, on the um, development of, of the technology front uh, and the deployment of the technology front, I want to talk about uh, just some of the s and side from battery materials. So we're changing uh, the, the sort of the, the, the key raw material input here from crude oil uh, which is ugly, and um, it's uh, it it's uh, it it doesn't do good things uh, in a lot of different ways. But in particularly in particular countries that produce it, it tends to be associated with uh, pollution, corruption, violence, etc., and so forth. And now we're going to cover to battery metals, which um, yeah, metals and mining uh, tends to be associated with pollution, corruption, violence, um, a lot of sort of the nastier side. How do we think about that externality in the context of moving towards electrified vehicles? Yes, great point. And recently there have been substantial breakthroughs in developing the solid state battery. That is the next generation battery that will contain abundant materials in a move away from cobalt in particular. What, what, what is a solid state battery? I'm going to interrupt you and just ask you to, to explain what that is. Yes, a solid state battery essentially allows for silicon or other uh, material that is not a liquid and therefore is much less flammable and also uh, can improve the energy density. Now, there are a variety of chemistries that are being developed that are in this uh, rubric or under this umbrella of what is called solid state. And just uh, recently in the last week or so, a paper was published by some researchers at Chalmers in Gothenburg, Sweden, that again shows that it is likely that our next generation battery by 2025 will be solid state. You may be aware that uh, Tesla in partnership with Panasonic is using a battery that uh, battery cell that is uh, minimized in terms of cobalt and Elon Musk is on a mission to eliminate cobalt from the battery cell over time. Uh, so, so, so cobalt is ugly because it's coming out of the DRC. Uh, I mean, the DRC is sort of, um, the D Democratic Republic of Congo is sort of the, the Saudi Arabia cobalt, and it's in a particularly bad way. So I can understand why moving away from cobalt is, is going to sort of reduce some of those externalities or some of those other factors. Um, but I'm really intrigued by this idea that, um, and the reason, I'm sorry, the reason why I say that is because if you're taking out cobalt, you're adding in other things. You know, you, you know you've got more nickel or you've gotten more, um, more manganese or, or whatever the, the, the technology is. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's sort of hard to get away from metals until you start talking to me about solid state batteries, uh, which is kind of exciting. So that says that by 2025, we've got a technology, which by the way, is like tomorrow in technology terms. It's yes. Like on the corner. Yeah. It's like, you know, here already. Uh, we've yeah. got Technology, which actually uh, substantially reduces our dependence on um, kind of uh, vulnerable to pipelines of raw materials that are vulnerable to bottlenecking and that are also kind of ugly to pull out of the ground and 
make a lot of mess and cause a lot of discomfort, uh, which is fantastic. So presumably from an ESG perspective, um, that just makes it a better sell. Going back to something yes. that I was talking yes. about. Yes, and, and presumably uh, cheaper as well. The updated Bloomberg New Energy Finance forecast for battery cell cost is now projecting a reduction below $100 per kilowatt hour sometime in the next three years. Amazing. And then if you think about Moore's law where you know the unit cost continues to come down asymptote to the, um, the x-axis, a solid state would kind of shift that curve down even, even more. And I think we're getting to a point in this decade where the battery cost now is much, much less expensive uh, than what we have in today's electric vehicles. Yeah, I mean, I was, so as I was preparing for this call, I was doing a little bit of reading and, um, and it's just sort of stunning because some of the things that I was reading uh, that go back even to say like 2017 or so, um, they were very starry-eyed about vehicles having a 300 to 350 kilometer range and being able to come in at, you know, at, at around 100 to 120,000 uh, US dollars per vehicle. And now uh, you've got vehicles which are easily hitting 500 kilometer ranges. I mean, some of them are even, you know, have longer range um, and are, you know, you can, you can pick up um, an electric vehicle, a BEV, you know, for 50 to 60,000, um, uh, which is, you know, quite a lot less than what we were looking at even, even several years ago. And that's entirely due to batteries. I mean, that's, it's all about batteries. It's about getting, getting more efficient batteries, getting cheaper batteries, getting longer lasting batteries. Um, so the technology gains that you're talking about um, are, are, pretty, are pretty substantial and, and, and overwhelming. And, and I think that's probably a big part, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak for you, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. That's, I'm guessing that's a big part of how you have your very optimistic forecast, um, which maybe isn't optimistic of getting to the U.S. at 100% uh, vehicle sales yeah. by 2025 and a park that's, a, that's fully electrified by 2050. You know, definitely. And one of the other ingredients, I think, James, is that when you get to scale in terms of manufacturing, the benefits in terms of the cost structure are immense. Sure. And Part of this equation of getting to price parity with gasoline powered vehicles is in fact getting plant production up to and over 100,000 units. Ideally, in, a, in an assembly plant for an electric vehicle, you should be able to make three to 400,000 units. And the square footage footprint of an electric vehicle in a plant is about half what is required to produce a gasoline powered vehicle. There's, so there's, there's extra real estate to put the battery pack construction co-located with the electric vehicle production and make that even more cost effective. So okay. think, about, think about potential Vertical integration, which is what Elon Musk has really done with his gigafactories combined with uh, the models that he's producing. Okay, then, then, so, so tell me then very quickly, why it is that some of the traditional OEMs are struggling to, um, to make headway or to, to, to keep up in this market? And you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe they're not struggling, but um, I think it was like three weeks ago, that Nikola was worth more than Ford. Um, you know, Nikola, which is years from uh, producing a vehicle uh, versus Ford, which has been producing vehicles for a century. Um, I know that at the Centennial. Um, or Tesla, which is just going through the roof. And it's a fantastic company, but it's still incredibly small next to a lot of the, I mean, Tesla's worth more than Toyota now, but it's, but it's a tiny fraction. Of, of Toyota in size. Why is it that you've got these new entrants who are doing so well in this space? You've got existing OEMs who know how to make vehicles. They know how to manufacture, to design, manufacture, and market uh, automobiles. 
they should have the capacity to develop the, the electric powertrain as well. Why are they succeeding to the same degree? Fantastic question. I think it comes down to some balance sheet issues and mm. this dichotomy that really has emerged in our global economy between the tech and the non-tech world. And let me be specific in terms of mobility. We have in the US many companies who have been here for uh, 50, 100 years and have established uh, their footprint across the Midwest in, this, in the Southern states. Mm. And for the most part, they have a very large capital stock and operating margins that are quite um, attractive for pickup trucks and crossovers and SUVs. To take the amount of capital, fixed capital that's required to convert a lot of these plants to electric vehicles, uh, that that'll, that'll take a, a fair amount of money. And many of these companies, you know, don't have the resources to do this quickly. And maybe from a legacy standpoint, they haven't had to really move quickly in the past. Some equity analysts criticize them for that. They lost the small car business in the 70s in the US when they didn't react quickly to the two oil price shocks that we had. And some analysts are projecting that they'll lose even more in this transition to electric vehicles. Yeah, I, I've got to be careful here, Elle, because um, this is going to, this could very easily turn into one of those three hour conversations where you and I start dissecting the history of the, of the, uh, of the auto, the auto, the automakers, um, which, which would be, I'm sure, incredibly fascinating to the two of us, but probably less so to the rest of the world at this point. Um, so, okay, I get it. Um, and, and, and you had me at legacy cost, but also, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of capital inertia that's that's in there and this is this is really unfortunate because i think um i think for for firms like uh like a ford or or um or a toyota just to take two that we've mentioned uh they they have a lot of resources to bear which should have which should be giving them an advantage but nonetheless we have the technology um we have uh we have the we have the need the environmental uh uh sort of const uh, the, the environmental sort of Damocles that's sort of hanging over our head, um, and we were t and 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 you were t you've been talking quite a li quite a lot about how the pricing has has been coming back into line, making this this really really attractive. Um, so I think pricing here is is also an important component. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you you guys you know have definitely touched on this this point, but. Um, but I think it's, you know, in, because you, you were mentioning about reaching the, the, the target, it's quite, it's quite funny because I was having the same um, converse, sort of conversation with my friends during uh, COVID times, like, what's the next car you want to buy? Um, of course, everyone is like, yeah, of course, a, a EV, but they're still very expensive compared to, uh, to other cars. And, um, but even Fiat, for example, you know, the, cause, cause I'm Italian and, uh, they have, uh, just recently come out with the, um, f uh, Cinquecento, like in the, like the, the 500 in the electric version, but it's really, more, it's way more expensive than normal car. Um, so I think people do want to buy EV. Um, also now with COVID, everyone wants to live in a suburb because they don't want to live in the city anymore, which implies the need of having mm -hmm. a car. Um, but then, you know, I think also another, um, yeah, well, uh, in fact, in China, actually, they, they do uh, have this uh, governmental scheme where you can apply for subsidies when you purchase the, the electric vehicles. Um, I think definitely that would be something that could help consumers, encourage consumers to purchase more. But also another point that, you know, my friends were raising is like, yes. When I used to live in Hong Kong, you could find a charging station every five meters, but in Italy, nowhere to be found. So how are you gonna you know, charge your car? 
That's, oh my uh, gosh, that's, that's wonderful. Annie, you've just given me a <laughs> segue into exactly what I wanted to ask Alan. And that was totally unrehearsed and unprompted. That was brilliant. Um, it's, that's a very, very good point that you've made about um, how when, when people are entering into the auto market, as, as, you, as you and I both well know, they enter in at the lower end and then they trade up over the course of their lives. You, know, you don't start with the Tesla or the Jag, you start with, um, I, I guess, a, a, a Fiat or you know, something at the lower end. Um, but so, so that makes it, so I, I get that. And, and you know, so there is, there is sort of a, um, a life cycle income uh, constraint here as millennials who want to buy the EVs may find themselves unable to buy. But I wanna talk about infrastructure before I run out of time. Um, because I think there's a lot of infrastructure that's necessary uh, in order to support um, the, the BEV uh, 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 park that we're talking about here. I mean, even if we're just charging at home, that's increasing the, the strain on the grid. You're going to be uh, in probably seeing people charging their vehicles uh, after they get home from work, which means that now you're going to start to have surge capacity having to to be increased to allow for this. You're going to have to increase the, the distribution capacity. Um, you're going to have to increase um, the infrastructure outlay in a, in a variety of ways. So first question, I have a follow-up, is to what extent is infrastructure constraint uh, on the BEV transition? Great. It, it is. And I think uh, the point that I wanted to make on charging infrastructure is that it is growing very rapidly. You're probably aware that there are a whole host of policies that have been deployed to defray the cost of construction for charging infrastructure. The major cost is if uh, a developer wants to put a level two charging station in a place where there isn't a transmission line. So not only do you have to build and put the charging station in, but you have to pull a new transmission line. That's where a lot of the cost is. But um, many governments have begun to offer developers discounts and support for the charging station infrastructure. In the US, we have uh, a law on the books right now that hasn't been really funded sufficiently, but would offer 30% of the cost of construction for charging infrastructure. We've also had a lot of sharing apps uh, just take off here and flourish. And, and they're also available in Europe and China where you can share um, a low grade charging uh, station with others. So I, I guess my point around charging infrastructure is it's growing fast. It is going to be less of a constraint, especially as we get to 2025. I think that it's going to build out substantially in the next you know, couple of years, really. There's a great, report I mentioned that IEA does every year and this year they did highlight some of the details around charging infrastructure which I thought was really informative especially for investors. Okay okay so there is a um, it's a hurdle that can be overcome but I was wondering if to what extent do we have to worry that this is a, sort of a, a trap so there's a Pareto inferior equilibrium that is not hydrogen, that is battery electric vehicles. What we should be thinking about is how to get ourselves to a fully hydrogen economy so that we can actually take more of these greenhouse gases or the, the, the pollution associated with production of, of the electricity out of the chain. But once we spent all this money that you're talking about with infrastructure, once we've all bought our battery electric vehicles, nobody's gonna really have a lot of appetite for funding the development of fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells which would be a Pareto superior outcome, potentially. I don't know, I'm throwing this out. Um, are we putting ourselves into an inferior equilibrium track? I think the hydrogen fueling structure will be very profitable and economic for heavy duty 
trucks. And as you know, they're the largest contributor within the mobile transport, not, I, and I, I want to park for a minute, uh, planes and container ships, uh, both of which are transportation yeah. niches that are very polluting. But if you look at um, heavy duty commercial trucks, there's a real possibility there for hydrogen. The medium duty trucks, you may be, you've got a great startup in the UK called Arrival. Uh, they're really taking over in terms of electric buses and medium sized vans that are used for last mile delivery for e-commerce. It's hard to see a hydrogen application for medium duty that's going to outshine the electric. Okay, so how the heavy duty hydrogen, I think, is, is a real deal because, you know, to build hydrogen infrastructure is super expensive. But if you have a depot for your heavy duty trucks and they can be fueled uh, in that way, I think, you know, a lot of people think that that's uh, a very strong possibility for that segment of the on-road transport. So, so let me see if I make sure that I'm kind of with you on this. So we currently have internal combustion engines and we've got a very extensive network of, um, of, of infrastructure to refuel cars. I know this because I drive a car and I refuel my car and there's a lot of gas stations. Um, so that's gonna exist uh, at least until 2050 because there's still gonna be some gasoline powered vehicles on the road. At the same time that we're building out the uh, the infrastructure in order to support uh, recharge of battery electric vehicles, so a lot of that happens at home, but a lot of it also has to happen on the road trip, at the office or at the hotel, at the office, uh, wherever you're going. We're going to have a third layer of infrastructure where um, there's heavy heavy truck vehicle uh, heavy truck depots where they're charging up hydrogen fuel cells and then driving cross country hitting another depot, recharging, driving across country, hitting another depot. That's three layers of infrastructure. Isn't that kind of a lot? Yeah, you know, I, it reminds me of the battle on computing. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to forecast exactly how this will emerge, but the electric charging infrastructure is cheaper than just about any other infrastructure out there. It's just cheaper. No, and, my you know, I, I may sound biased and uh, you know, I did, I did actually receive a scholarship to do a paper on alternative fuel infrastructure. And I went by fuel by fuel. And it does turn out that, you know, hydrogen, is uh, infrastructure, it's just, ex it's very expensive. What you have to do, the amount of cement that you have to, <laughs> you have to use in order to secure storage of hydrogen fuel is, is substantial. So you gotta have, you gotta have a lot of revenue in the pipeline to uh, justify the cost of that. It's funny, you talk about computing standards as being um, what this reminds you of. I, I'm taken back, uh, and now I'm going to date at least myself, uh, to VHS and Betamax, because we all know that Betamax was yeah. the but <laughs> Of course, nobody uses either anymore, so right. that is, is, is the punchline. Um, okay, so very ambitious. Uh, that gets us to 2050, but the only way we're going to, uh, I mean, in, in, this, in this world that you're talking about, we've got... Um, We've got this transition that gets us to a park that's, uh, that's fully electrified by, by 2050. And the only way to get there um, is by uh, sort of getting ESG savvy investors today to be focusing their attention on, on these kinds of companies um, so that they have the resources that can get us there you know, several decades in the future. And, and, and it sounds to me like there's a lot of profit to be made, so it's not charity. Um, but also, yeah, I think, I think too, I'm sorry to interrupt, but please. you know, it's also going to take policy stimulus. And I, I want to be very, uh, very clear 
that this process of transition will be a partnership between the marketplace and the public sector because most countries have really not signed on to a carbon tax that reflects the true cost of CO2 emissions. We need other policies. And, you know, Econ 101 says when you have a negative externality like pollution, there's a role for government intervention. And we need to see more policy stimulus on the demand side and the supply side with regard to uh, getting to uh, technologies that are more clean energy over time. And I, I just want to be clear about that, that you know, it won't just happen on its own in the private sector. I, I really don't think that will happen. Does that put Europe ahead of the US? Europe and China in particular, and I wanted to mention as I went through all the latest policy initiatives, you know, in the COVID response packages uh, to stimulate and buttress the decline in economic activity, you know, Germany has actually embedded uh, a 3,000 euro subsidy for an EV purchase that is uh, for an EV priced under 40,000 euros. Uh, that then means their total subsidy for electric vehicles is 9,000 euros as of today. France has an EV subsidy up to 12,000 euros, especially if you scrap an older diesel car you get a bonus of 5,000 euros. And uh, that means that, you know, the, the French subsidy scheme is quite luxurious. And in Spain, um, up to 4,000 Euro, euros, and uh, that would include scrappage of a 10-year-old vehicle. Europe is very fond of scrappage programs, as you know, you're there. Uh, but they put these additional subsidy schemes in as part of their stimulus package. We have not done that here in the US. So you expect the vehicle sales and the park targets that it would be comparable ahead of 2035 and 2050? Okay, and, and let me add the other policy. You're probably aware of the CO2 emissions requirements for vehicles in Europe. They're going down to 95 grams per kilometer in 2021. And all of the automakers in Europe are having to translate and move their production from gasoline powered to battery electric and plug-ins in 2021. It's a significant uh, constraint on their existing profile, which is, and I don't have the exact number, but something like 120 grams per kilometer. That's a substantial reduction. And I think, you know, just to talk about the policy menu, I mentioned subsidies on the demand side to help consumers purchase an electric vehicle. Then there are the CO2 emissions requirements directed at the automakers. And also on the supply side, not only helping to defray the cost of charging station uh, construction, but also helping companies retool their plants to produce electric vehicles. So all of those policies are being considered in most countries today. I think, I think you also mentioned, um, you also mentioned financial transparency, uh, which is, is I think an important part of that whole, I would say it's a policy, but it's part of that policy framework. So in other words, it, it, you need that in order for, for people to be able to invest. Are the Europeans um, ahead of the US in making it easier for ESG type investors to have the transparency that they need in order to invest with confidence? 
Yes, indeed. If you look at the network for greening the financial system, all of the uh, nation banks, central banks, but then the European Central Bank and all of the other major central banks globally are members of the network for greening the financial system with the exception of the US Federal Reserve, which is not a member. And most uh, companies, uh, if you look at the companies that have signed up to the task force for climate related financial disclosure, most of those are European uh, companies, European banks. Uh, to some extent, some US companies have signed up. Uh, in other words, Europe has really been advancing in terms of making transparent climate risks on company balance sheets. You probably know better than I do, when you read the uh, reports, earnings reports and so forth, and proxy statements for companies, that the way that they disclose their climate risks is from A to Z, very hard to understand what the true climate risk is. However, if they're following the guidelines of the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, uh, an investor has a much better understanding of what their climate risks are. And I think over time that, you know, will be a very key enabler to help capital flow uh, much more appropriately than it does today when we're all out here guessing what the climate risk is. It's interesting how we keep talking about United States and Europe and China. In fact, those are the biggest contributors to the greenhouse uh, gas emissions like between Europe and, and China and, and the United States. Um, despite you know, the, the technology that we, we, we have so, and, and all the emerging markets actually contribute to less than 1%. For me, that's actually quite bizarre, um, you know, like, to data. So I would like to ask you, Ellen, like, what's the main reason um, that's like this, this such huge disparity, um, but also what we can do in terms of driving also the emerging markets and developing countries to reduce the, the um, greenhouse gas emission there? It costs money to undertake startup and innovative activities. And that cost is really, um, you know, it's happening in the US, in Europe, in China. And over time, that will reduce the cost for emerging markets to transition to a clean energy future. In other words, we're making the investment that will have global benefits over time in terms of you know, how they can begin to adopt these clean energy technologies. There's no question that if this activity wasn't happening today in the, in the mature markets in, in China, that it would make it much more difficult for the emerging markets in the future. So we're putting a down payment on, we're developing these technologies. And as we do that, the cost of it begins to fall uh, and become more favorable and get to a point where it can be adopted more broadly. So I think you know, that's, a, that's a kind of a, a lesson that we've learned historically that over time, when these technologies develop, they become much more accessible uh, to the broader population. I think that's a really good point, Ellen. And, you know, we can, we can just think about what's going on with, um, with telecommunications. So in, in a lot of emerging markets, uh, they're just leapfrogging straight to, uh, to a cell phone focused network and not even have to waste their time investing in, in terrestrial systems uh, because they, they could just access the technology. So presumably in a lot of these EMs, if China, the US and Europe have made this hard investments in, um, in developing the technology, then they, the technology can flow through to EMs. I, I wonder though, if this doesn't kind of keep a lot of these emerging markets permanently uh, on the back foot, because that 
that the scale economies that you were talking about before, remember, you know, a minimum of 100,000 units coming out of off an assembly line, ideally 300,000 units. Um, if the Chinese have gotten there first, if the Germans have gotten there first, if um, even if Detroit's gotten there, probably not first, um, you know, that doesn't leave a lot of room for, uh, I don't know, Sao Paulo or Lagos or, you know, um, you know other, other emerging, emerging regions. Um, so I do, I do think that 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 it's sort of it's going to be a longer term um, sort of challenge to make sure that the benefits, not just of the product but also of the production, can can be delivered globally. Um, Alan, I'm really really cognizant of of time, and you super super generous, uh, and I'm really really grateful. And it's, it's always so great to talk to you. Um, Thank you. This has been fantastic. That... Annie, great to meet you. And I, I just really um, very much appreciate your work that you're doing in ESG. Thank you. Yeah, she's a star. She's, she's a star. We're very lucky. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything, I just before you, before you go, because um, I know that the conversation's sort of been a bit uh, organic. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that you wanted to mention that, that we've, we've left out or neglected to, to touch upon. I, th I think we covered all the key elements, uh, except for, the, I guess, the question about how dynamic it is. We, we need to check in in 90 days because it, it's moving so quickly. And I think it's important for investors to be cognizant of whatever the latest developments are, because it is changing pretty rapidly. Yeah, and, we, and obviously we can see that you know, everybody who's watching this this webinar is is surely aware. They were aware before they died, before they they started they hit the play button, and if not, they're aware now how you can have these these massive uh, price movements in like a company like Nikola, which, as I said, hasn't produced a vehicle uh, and is years away um, versus right. establishing. So this is really something that I think investors can't just kind of buy and, and, and close their eyes. They need to pay attention to what they're investing in and how they're going to hold it. Uh, Ellen, thank you again. And um, you. really appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.